All right, so uh, I'm a human milk immunologist at Mount Sinai in New York City. Um, and uh, today I'm gonna talk to you about our work on the human milk immune response to SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, so just because not everyone's coming from the same background, I'm gonna give a little bit uh, of background on antibodies and other parts of the immune system in general. So antibodies are a protective protein produced by B cells in response to the presence of a foreign substance. And they recognize and latch onto the foreign substance so that they can be removed from the body. Um, and when this foreign substance enters the body, the immune system recognizes it because its proteins differ from the self and any antibodies that might react with self are, at least in theory, not present and eliminated as part of the development of the immune system. So those proteins from a foreign element like a virus are very different from our own proteins. And so an antibody has two sides. Um, it has the variable side where you see the Vs here. Um, that's what contacts the pathogen like SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. Um, and those are different for every antibody is a little bit different in its variable region. And that is how they recognize a foreign protein. And then this other side is the constant region or the FC region. And that's what will mediate some other antiviral activities um, and bind to receptors um, on some of the cells of our immune system. So there are different flavors of antibodies. Um, I'm mainly gonna be talking about IgA today because IgA is about 90% of antibody in milk. Um, but in serum, so in our blood, you mostly hear about IgG. So that's what's dominant in serum. And then there are other flavors I won't get into today, but just so you know, there's many different types of antibodies and it's not so simple just to say antibodies and be done with it. So there's many types. So in human milk, um, antibody, as I said, is about 90% IgA, mostly as a dimer, meaning two IgAs bound together. And most of that is going to be in secretory form. So secretory antibodies are polymeric. So that means they have different types of proteins combined. Um, and they are, in this case, the a dimer, which is mostly how you find IgA in milk, is going to be bound together by another protein called J-chain that's made by the B cells and then wrapped up in secretory component. So I, this is a little cartoon of that. There are two kinds of IgA. I'm not gonna get into that today, but they're structurally a little bit different and IgA1 is dominant. Um, so here you see a dimer, which is complexed by J chain, which is made by the B cells. And that's mostly what you find in milk in terms of the total composition. Uh, and then it gets wrapped up um, as part of its secretion into milk in this secretory component. So secretory component, is critical for the protection uh, against degradation in harsh mucosal environments like milk, like the baby's um, oral nasal cavity, and especially the GI tract. So we evolved to have this highly protected form of antibody in our mucosal fluids because they are relatively harsh compared to uh, serum. Um, so what's interesting is that um, one thing we're exploring in my lab is that secretory IgA derived from milk, um, because you can get milk in large quantities, um, as a therapeutic class of antibody against COVID or other pathogens may be highly efficient um, when you need those antibodies to be durable in those harsh mucosal environments like the respiratory tract, the GI tract. Oh, secretory antibodies, um, you don't have to get too wrapped up in this diagram, but as I said, and for those that are interested, the way that they get their secretory component is that actually when the B cells transit to the mammary gland and they secrete that IgA dimer as it's being pumped into the milk, a piece of the, um, the receptor that pumps the IgA into the milk comes off and that's secretory chain. And then that is what wraps up the um, IgA. So we also have um, IgG and other forms in milk. IgG is about 2% of the total, and that's going to generally come from the serum, coming in a relatively passive manner. Um, the B cells that ultimately produce milk secretory IgA actually originate mostly from the gut, from the uh, gut-associated lymphatic tissue. And so this is known as the enteromammary link. And you can imagine this is a very important um, evolved mechanism to help babies survive in an environment um, as we were evolving or in low-income settings today where modern medicine is not available. And whatever the 
lactating person um, breathes in or ingests in the form of pathogen, then um, an immune response is raised in the gut predominantly, and then B cells from the gut transit through the lymphatics to the mammary gland and thus make antibodies that are highly durable in the milk that actually protect the baby from those very same pathogens and stop the baby from dying from those pathogens. What is passive immunization? So when a baby um, or child gets human milk, uh, they're not, it's not like they're getting vaccinated. It's not like they're getting infected themselves, but it's what we call passive immunization. So this passive protection works by coating the mucous membranes of the baby's mouth, upper respiratory area, and digestive tract, and it provides a layer of protection that may stop cells in those areas from being infected if the baby's exposed to virus, or it may mitigate that infection, so slow down viral replication. So this effect is temporary and the antibodies would be expected to be degraded or washed away within a few hours. So this has to be replenished with every feed. Now babies um, get their milk very frequently, so this should not be a problem, but the effect is gonna be dose dependent. So your exclusively breastfed baby who's not getting any other food or fluids is going to have the longest lasting coat of uh, milk antibodies. And then a toddler who's also eating solids it's not going to be that significant of an effect, relatively speaking. Now, these milk antibodies do not pass through the baby's digestive system into the bloodstream. You would not detect them in the blood. They are a coating of the mucous membranes. So our COVID-19 studies, we have two of them. Um, I was NIH funded with an R01 for our infection study in 2020 as part of the emergency funding. And we also have a vaccine study that I'm just going to mention at the end of my presentation. So for our infection study, the participants had a PCR confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, or for our vaccine study, they were vaccinated, but that's a separate study. Um, we asked for about 30 mils or one ounce of milk um, per sample using whatever pumps these participants had at home and were comfortable with. Um, the milk was pumped at home according to a schedule that we requested, labeled and frozen at home and then picked up uh, originally by me during the shutdown and then later by courier or, or ship, shipment by milk store from milk carrier company. Um, and then this was designed as a longitudinal study. So milk was obtained originally three to six weeks after infection. Um, and then we asked participants to continue to pump monthly samples for as long as they were able. So initially, to show you the results from our COVID infection study, um, in a subset of samples, we have many, many, many samples. We have hundreds and hundreds of participants. In this part of the study, um, we screened undiluted processed milk. So we just centrifuge the milk to remove the fat and the cells, and we keep the skim milk fraction, which is what we test. So we looked at 75 COVID-19 recovered um, participants, and also we used 20 pre-pandemic milk samples from other studies um, to form a positive cutoff in terms of um, uh, antibody against the COVID-19 spike. We use an ELISA, which is a very um, tried and tested method to look at the response um, of antibodies in a solution of any fluid against um, any protein of interest. So we get recombinant spike protein, we code it down to a plastic assay plate, and we essentially just look at the response of the milk against that spike protein, and we can quantitate uh, how much antibody is there. So looking at 75 people and this dotted line being our positive cutoff, um, which is based on our pre-pandemic control background levels in this ELISA, we found that just about 90% of milk samples obtained from these COVID-19 recovered donors had significant levels of SARS-CoV-2 specific IgA. Um, this is an absolute positive cutoff level. So if you have samples from before an infection, which we did not at the time for this subset, and you could compare the relative increase for particular individuals, it's actually much more like 100% of people have a response after infection, but our absolute cutoff is pretty stringent. So in that sense, it's about 90% past the absolute cutoff for positivity. This initial screening, 40 of the spike positive samples were further titrated, so serially diluted to find the binding endpoint titer. So this is an assessment of antibody affinity and or quantity. Um, so the way you do that is you, is you basically look at what dilution of milk gives an optical density value of one, so the amount of light 
um, in this ELISA assay. And then you can see each of these is the dilution curve. You can see every milk sample, although positive, looks very different because the quality of the response differs. And so what we found is that of these um, 40 samples that were positive on the screen, 95% of those had a positive endpoint titer, so they were of high quality. And about half of those were what we consider high titer, so a high quality or quantity of antibody in the sample, which is about five times the endpoint titer cutoff. And about 95% also had spike-specific secretory antibody, which of course we're very interested in because that is the most durable class of antibody in milk. So when we do our secretory antibody, ELISA, we look for antibodies, um, we look for secretory components. So those could, that could be on uh, IgA, it could be on IgM, which also has a secretory form. Um, it could be some other strange artifact, like just free floating secretory component, but that's a lot less likely. But just because we measure IgA doesn't mean we know it's secretory IgA until we also measure secretory antibody and compare those data. So what we also found was that about 75% of these samples did contain spike-specific IgG, which is the dominant form in serum, but can also be detected in milk. But um, it was very low. And as you can see, only about really one passed our high titer cutoff. And it was generally a low titer IgG response. But it's hard to detect IgG in milk because overall very little is in the milk. What was very important was that we found that IgA and secretory antibody titers were highly correlated, which strongly suggested that most or nearly all of the IgA was in secretory form, which is very important for um, potential protection of the baby. And we also performed neutralization assays, which looked at the ability of these antibodies to actually block SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, this was using a pseudovirus, which is a harmless virus that's been made to have the SARS-CoV-2 spike attached to it. And so we can measure um, how well the antibodies block infection. And what we found was that there was potent COVID neutralizing activity, which strongly correlated with the amount of secretory IgA in the sample. And then finally, um, what we found more recently, which is very important, is that the milk secretory IgA infection response is very durable over time. So when we have um, time points up to 12 months post-infection, what you can see is that there is hardly a significant change at all um, in these 20 or so people that we have looked at so far. And you can see that when we do the statistical analysis, there is no change between these groups at any time point in terms of the endpoint titer for the secretory IgA. So this is a very, very durable response over time after infection. So to summarize, the post-COVID-19 infection response is secretory IgA dominant, which really is a classic mucosal infection response. The secretory IgA is neutralizing, and it's very, very long lasting over time. Now, I didn't show you, but I'll just tell you that the post-COVID-19 vaccine response is actually IgG dominant. It's a classic intramuscular injection response. It does not follow this mucosal pathway at all. Um, and the adeno-based vaccines like J&J &J and AstraZeneca actually had very poor responses in milk, very low titers and very, very low secretory antibody was actually found for any type of vaccine. Um, and it was very limited durability over time. So a strong contrast to the mucosal infection response. The intramuscular injection response was really different and not very long lasting. So what this you know, really tells us is that vaccines that elicit a potent secretory IgA response, like your classic mucosal infection response, those vaccines are really needed. And that's one of the overarching goals of my lab is to design those vaccines with the lactating population in mind. And we have some preliminary animal studies towards that goal right now. I'd like to thank everyone in my lab, the Kramer lab for the spike protein, um, Medela for initially supporting milk shipping costs by Milk Stork. I'm supported by the NIH and of course our milk donors. Thank you.